greatest prayer warriors in the history of the world have been, are, and always will be mothers. Mothers are the greatest prayer warriors. They're the greatest intercessors. They are the epitome of what it is to pray without ceasing. Mothers pray without ceasing for their children. I asked Julie this week, I said, you know, we've always prayed for our kids and we've prayed verses over them and things. And I just said, well, you know, how and what have you prayed for our children over the years? Oh, she just starts spitting it out. She goes, from the beginning? I said, yeah. I said, well, I prayed that I would get pregnant and I prayed I would stay pregnant. I prayed it would be a safe delivery. She said, you don't pray for no pain because it just doesn't happen without pain. So you pray for a safe delivery. She said, I prayed for healthy babies. When they got sick, I prayed they'd get well. When I was nursing, I prayed they would nurse well. When they were feeding, I prayed they would hold their food down. She said, in the bed, I prayed they would stay in the bed and stay safe and that nothing would happen during the night. When they were teething, I prayed their teeth would come through. When they were sick, I prayed their sickness would go away. She said, when they were crawling, I prayed, well, she said, I prayed that they would roll over, first of all. That was a big deal to mothers, I guess. You know, from the back, and you walk in one day, and they're on their stomach, <gasps> and she prayed for that. Wow, okay. She prayed that they would crawl. She prayed that they would walk. She prayed that they would run. She prayed that the angels would protect them because they are half my child. <laughs> and she knew what that would mean in the years to come. She prayed for their sports. She prayed for their teachers. She prayed for their class. She prayed for their friends. She prayed when they tried out for a team that they would make the team. She prayed that they would get to play on the team. She prayed that they would be accepted by their friends. She prayed for good friends. She prayed that they would do well in school. She prayed their grades would do well. She prayed that they would learn things that they weren't all that good at. And she prayed for the right teacher to show the right student, one of ours, what they needed to learn. She prayed for their girlfriends and their boyfriends. She prayed for them to pass the L L what's the PSAT and then the SAT and the ACT. She prayed they would get accepted into college. And when they got into college, she prayed they would stay in college. And when they stayed in college, she prayed that they would finish college. And when they finished college, she prayed they would find the career of their choice, that thing that would fulfill them, that, that thing that helps them see what their true north is. She prayed for that. She prayed for their spouses, play that all the way back to the moment she's pregnant, she started praying for their spouses then. When they're of marital age, she prayed for the men and the women in their lives to be the right one that would be spiritually mature and would grow. She prayed for their engagement, she prayed for their wedding preparation, she prayed for the wedding, she prayed that I would find the money to pay for the wedding. She prays for their marriages. She prays for all aspects of their marriages. She prayed for grandchildren. She encouraged them to pray for children as well. And lo and behold, we have five in the basket right now, so praise God for that. She prays for those grandchildren. She prays for our children's marriages and all other things. She has been a mother for 32 years, and there's not been a day go by where she has not prayed for her children by name. Women, mothers are the greatest prayer warriors on earth. When she laid out what and how she prayed, I just went, wow. I said, I didn't know you were praying all of that. She goes, yeah. She said, you want to know how to pray for you? I said, no. <laughs> That's between you and the Lord. With the results are, I'm happy with it. But she said, well, how and what do you pray for our children? Well, <laughs> not quite as detailed as yours. I'm more of a 30,000-foot prayer. I pray that they would grow mentally, physically, spiritually, socially, emotionally, and financially, and that they would find joy in their work and their spouse and their careers and their calling. She said, that's it? I said, well, that's everything you said. You just put in a bunch of lines underneath it. I'm kind of a, a general thing. I know the Lord knows what I mean, but you know, if you're spending all that much time, I'll pray for something else. <laughs> Praying mothers. There are two famous mothers in the Bible, absolutely hands down, no questions, no debate. The greatest mother in the history of the world would have to be Mary, the mother of Jesus. I mean, being the mother of God is, I mean, that puts you in rarefied air. The second greatest mother is not as famous, although her name was the 25th 
most chosen girl's name last year on New Babies. This lady, not quite as famous, but equally as great, almost didn't become a mother. In fact, she wasn't a mother for a long time. Her trip into motherhood was, was prefaced with sorrow and grief and humiliation and tears. And she prayed a prayer that goes down in the history of prayers as the absolute greatest, coolest, phenomenal prayer for a child that any mother has ever prayed for her child. Her name is Hannah. Her name means grace. Her son's name is Samuel. His name means heard by God. Her story is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. So if you have your Bibles, let's go there and see what we can learn. If you're a mother, uh, study these chapters thoroughly on your own. I'll give you an overview of what they're about tonight. If you want to be a mother someday, she's a great woman to study and see how she goes through it. If you're going through some issues, she's also yours. So Hannah is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. Now, her first part of her life is just, uh, she suffered. Let me hear you say, Hannah suffered. And these are easy notes tonight. You can write the word suffered in the margin of your Bible or text it or however you do that these days. And there was a husband named Elkanah. He was a man of some esteem. You can tell that by the lineage they always give. And he's a so-and-so who was so-and-so who was so-and-so. But it gets good in verse 2. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I just like Penina. Sounds good. <laughs> Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Hannah was his first wife. Hannah was the wife he loved. But in those days, if your wife couldn't have children, which she couldn't, then you got to marry another one. And you say, wait a second. I thought it was one wife for life. It is. But 3,000 years ago, you had to have sons and daughters to run the family business and take it over. And so it was politically and, and sociologically what they did back then. He loved Hannah, but she couldn't have children. Panina did. Panina did. Pa Panini, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> but here's where the suffering begins. Panina had children, but Hannah did not. It was a humiliation not to be able to have children. I guarantee you from her wedding night on, she prayed, Lord, may I have many children. Give me sons and daughters to give my husband. And yet God didn't answer her prayer, so she had a barren womb, which was considered a punishment, a judgment of God against her. So it's a humiliation. And then her husband marries another woman, brings a second woman into the home, Penina, and she's a fertile myrtle and starts cranking out babies. <laughs> but you can tell that that Elkanah loved Hannah the most. Let me show you why. This is the coolest thing. Verse 4. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Hannah got the filet, Penina got fajitas. <laughs> Created tension, verse 6. Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Man, your two wives are the same husband. It's tense enough as it is with two wives. It's challenging enough with one wife. Two of them in the same house and one of them's having babies in the other one. She could have done a great thing by saying, Hannah, look, you know, until the Lord blesses you, help me raise my children to the glory of God. But she doesn't. She taunts Hannah, makes fun of her. And uh, every year they go to the, the Shiloh to worship. And year after year, verse 7, Penina would taunt Hannah at the tabernacle. Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Doesn't get any better. She's childless. She's taunted by her, the other wife. And then her husband is just a typical husband. For those of you that are thinking you might trade your husband in, read verse 8 before you make any serious decisions. She's having all these hard times, and here's what Elkanah says. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be so downtrodden just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? <laughs> We're all alike 3,000 years ago or today. We don't get it. <laughs> he didn't get it. Hey, you got me. I'm better than ten sons. To which Julie said, yeah, and you're as much trouble as ten sons, too. 
So things weren't working well for Hannah. Her response to this trouble, to this taunting, to this, this discouragement, to this lowest point in her life was to pray. Let me hear you say pray. In the midst of your suffering, your sorrow, maybe you want to get pregnant, but you can't. Maybe you are pregnant, but things aren't working right. Maybe you have a child, but there's some disabilities there. Maybe you had a husband, but he leaves you. Whatever your sorrow, whatever your suffering is, you're not alone. Hannah, the second greatest mother in history only to marry, had her own sorrows to begin with. Her response was to pray. Look at verse 9. Once after a sacrifice meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at the customary office place beside the, the, the tabernacle, verse 10. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. You cry out to the Lord when you have a desire, when you have a want. Have you prayed? How many of you have been at that point in your prayer life where your life, something was so bad, so heavy, so burdensome that you wept, you had bitter tears, and there was anguish? Is that, if that's happened to you, would you say, yes, it has? Yeah, that's a tough place to be. It's not a place you want to go, but yet when you get there, there's almost like nowhere to go but up, and she is at that point. She's been praying for children for years, never got one. She's taunted every year. She's reminded of it every year, and this time she just breaks down, and she goes into the tabernacle, and she prays, and Eli, Eli is there. If your life is hurting, fast and pray and say, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, help me out. Lord, give me an answer. Give me something. She prayed. And then the next thing she did was she promised. Let me hear you say promise. This is the coolest prayer right here, verse 11. And she made this vow, this promise. She said, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours, uh, he will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Samuel would become the second most famous long-haired man in the Bible. Who's the first? Very good. She prays this prayer. Now, when you're desperate, you come to let's make a deal with God. And let's make a deal with God isn't a sinful thing. It's where you go when you're a human consulting the, the one who created the universe. When you're hurting and your prayers aren't being answered, you come to that point, Lord, if you will, I will. She said, Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. And suddenly things begin to change. If you will, I will. Now listen, making a deal with God is not a sin. Breaking a deal with God is. The Bible says it is better not to make a vow to the Lord than to make a vow and break it. She makes a serious vow, but she didn't have anything to lose. If the Lord gives me a child, I'll give him back to the Lord. It's easy to pray when you don't have a child to give back. But look what God does for her. Eli, who wasn't the greatest priest in the history, he sees her mouthing but not praying any sounds. And so he says, oh, this woman, she's drunk. In verse 15, she says, Oh, no, sir, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Eli wasn't any better with dealing with a crying woman than her own husband was. She pours her heart out, and she says, I'm asking God for a request. He doesn't say, well, what's the request? He just wants to get rid of her. Oh, great. Well, may the Lord answer your prayers. Amen. For all he knew, she could have said, may Eli die. <laughs> but again, he's a priest. He's got a crying woman. He doesn't know what to do. It's an awkward situation. So he says, well, may the Lord grant you her request. But for her, it was a sign from God. She poured her heart out to the Lord, and like a divine appointment, God does it back. How many of you have prayed? And out of the coolest, weirdest thing, a divine appointment happens, an answer happens, something clicks, and you go, wow, there is a God of the universe, and he does pay attention to my life. If that's happened to you, say it has. That's what makes Christianity so fun. It's what makes walking in the Spirit so exciting. It's alive and active. Look what happens to her, verse 18. She said, oh, thank you, sir. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. She went from sorrow to prayer to promising God to God saying, Hannah, I got you. And she goes home and she starts sleeping with Elkanah, which I'm sure he was happy for the opportunity. 
Next thing you know, she's pregnant, verse 20, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked the Lord for him. Another, the Hebrew says, the Lord hears, the Lord heard my prayer. She has his baby within the year. They're going back to the temple to worship, to do the festivals. There's three of them. There was the uh, festival of uh, Passover, then there was the harvest, and then there was shelter. So you went to the temple three times a year required by the law. So they're going back, and Elkanah and his family, verse 21, they're there. But Hannah, verse 22, she didn't go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned. Then I'll take him to the tabernacle and leave him there with the Lord permanently. Whatever you think's best, Elkanah agreed. That's the first smart thing he's done in the whole story. And you husbands, look, just yes, dear. That's the translation for yes, dear. <laughs> whatever you think is best, because whatever you think is going to be what we do anyway, so we might as well just say, oh, boy, I'm getting into trouble. I'll back out of that one right now. He said, stay here for now, and may the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until he was weaned. Now, back then, you generally nursed your children until they were about three years old. If I was Hannah, and I knew I had to give this baby up, I think I would have nursed him until he was 12. <laughs> but it's about three years, and she hasn't gone to the temple in three years. She is cherishing every moment of this deal. She's got this baby for the first time, answered a prayer. I guarantee you every diaper she cleans, she prays God for, every sickness, everything about him. She was praying nonstop for her little boy, Samuel. She prayed, she promised, and she let go. Three years later, she weans him, and then she takes him to the church. Verse 24. When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull and some basket of flour, verse 25. They sacrificed the bull. They brought the boy to Eli, they. And normally when it's they, husband and wife, the man does the talking. But look what happens in verse 26. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. She did what everybody does to every preacher or priest in the world. We have a conversation with you, and five years later you walk up after church and you say, Do you remember me? And it's a loaded question. We hardly can win because if we say yes and we don't, we just lied before the Lord. If we say no, then we hurt your feelings. The only time it works, one out of a three shot, is, yeah, I do remember you, but it's tough. So next time you talk to your pastor or priest or king, just say, you probably don't remember me, but da 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 I was at Mancation last week, and a guy came up to me after one of the services, and he says, do you remember me? And I, I, here's my answer. And so when you come up to me and say, well, do you remember me? And you'll make a joke about it. Here's my answer. While I'm over 50, my memory's fading. Help me refresh it a little bit. So I give him that goofy line. I say, well, and guys are better than women. Women just stand there to see if you're ever going to figure it out. <laughs> you don't remember? <laughs> Ten years ago, after church, on a Thursday night. Remember, don't you? Yeah. Anyway, this guy comes up and he says, do you remember me? Uh, help me out a little bit. He said, well, it was almost 10 years ago. Okay, give me a little credit. You know, nobody remembers 10 years. He said, my wife and I, we could not have children. We've been praying. We've been trying. We're doing everything and nothing happened. And in the old sanctuary, he said, we came up to you one Sunday after church and told you our situation. He said, you called Julie over, and he said, you prayed for us. And when you prayed, and Julie prayed that we would have a child within the year. And he said, our daughter turns nine years old this year. And I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> now, before you come down here thinking old Robert's got the Midas touch, man, just pray there and poof, it happens. It ain't me, it's Julie, okay? She's the one, so she gets everything she asks for. <laughs> she says, do you remember me? And then she jumps in and says, here's my promise. And she gives him the boy. She let him go. She prayed, she promised, she got her promise. God kept his end of the promise, she kept her end of the promise. Here's my three-year-old son, he's dedicated to the Lord. Here he is, he's the Lord's for the rest of his life. She let go. That blows my mind away. 
Here's a woman who'd never had children, had gone through bitter suffering, finally got one because of a deal she made with God. And three years later, right on cue, on commitment, she says, Lord, here he is. I give him back to you. How would you like to let go of a three-year-old child, your first and only child? Some of you have had to let go of children in bitterness and in death. Children do die. There are accidents. There are sicknesses. Children die of cancer. And as you're here, maybe you're here on Mother's Day. Maybe it's so many, it's so bitter, they don't go to church on Mother's Day because it hurts too much. But if you're here, if you know one of those who's lost a child, remember this. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. When a child dies in innocence, you can be certain a God of mercy and love and grace calls them to heaven instantly. And there's nothing you can do to stop it in so many cases. And when it happens, your heart is ripped out and you hurt and you ache. But you know your child is in heaven because Jesus said, such is the kingdom of heaven. And you trust Jesus and you live for him and the day will come when you go to heaven and you meet that child again in a happy union. How would you like to give up a child? How would you like to, three years old, say, here's my child dedicated to the Lord. I'm giving him to you. We have had here at CBC parents of teenagers try to do that. <laughs> Robert, my son or daughter is all yours. Please do something. No, no, we don't, we don't do that anymore. You shoo, shoo, go away. They're, they're yours, not ours. <laughs> but she gives them to the Lord. Now, I'll be honest with you. If I was Hannah and I had this prayer and I had this precious three-year-old, three-year-olds are just when kids are really getting fun and cute and running around and talking. I mean, I love three to five because you can play with them there. You know, when they're small, you can't. You just got to hold them. But she lets her child go. You got to do the same thing. We all have to. Maybe not at three, maybe not at 12, but somewhere between 12 and 18 or 19 or 20 mothers, you got to learn to let your children go. You can't hang on to them. Do so and you'll set them free. She lets her child go at three. Now, I'd have been a little bitter. I'd have been a little upset. I'd have been happy that the Lord gave me a child and I gave him back. But look what Hannah does. She prays. She promises. She lets him go. And then the fourth thing is she praised the Lord. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Right after she gives the child to, back to the Lord, verse 1. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. If you're one of those that had to let a child go back to heaven, maybe after two years or three years or months, your heart aches, but there comes a point where you got to say, Praise the Lord, I had him for a year, I had him for three years, I had him for five years or 12, or whatever happened. It hurts, it aches, but you say, Lord, Thank you that I had them for the time that I did. They changed my world. I've been with parents with, with premature and situations in the hospitals, and it is breaks your heart. But you have to realize God gives them, and then sometimes God calls them home. Nothing easy about it, and there's no clever verse that I can give you except this. Hannah gave up her child, and she praised God from whom all blessings flowed. But the last thing she did was she stayed in touch. Let me hear you say stay in touch. The story goes on in chapter 2, uh, verse 18. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. And now I'd like for everybody to say, aw. Every year. Remember, they were about 20 miles away from Shiloh. And you say, well, that's not a very far trip. What 20 miles was to them, what driving from here to El Paso is to us. How many of you drive to El Paso on a regular basis? You just kind of, hey, you want to go to El Paso for the weekend? Nobody. That was 12 hours. And 20 miles was the same thing. But she went to the temple at least three times a year. And if I was Hannah, I'd have probably said to Elkanah, we need to go to Shiloh to buy some stuff. And she sees her little baby boy, three-year-old toddler, Samuel, growing up. Each year she gives him a new coat. I can see her hugging him and playing with him as he's growing up. He's a little preacher boy. He's got the suit. He's serving the Lord. A kid's way mature beyond his years. And she hugs him and she loves him. And is everything going great? I can hear him saying, Mom, stop it. Come on. I'm, I'm a minister. You can't just hug me like this. I'm seven years old. <laughs> 
And these little coats get a little bigger, a little bigger, and she watches her son grow up. Still aches, but she sees her son growing up. She stayed in touch. Mothers, you got to stay in touch. Probably the best thing since the, uh, what do you call that thing, the sl baby sling? Cell phones are the second best thing to baby slings. You know, the sling, you keep your baby right next to you. Cell phones, and you children and older children and teenagers, you think you're, you're really cool because your mom gave you a cell phone. Oh, she loves me. She trusts me. No, she wants to stay with you. <laughs> and nothing stays with you better than your cell phone. But it's a nice gift, and it's a small price to pay to stay in touch. Stay in touch with your teenagers with that cell phone. They're really cool. There's some apps you can put on there that will tell you exactly where that cell phone is at any given time. Anywhere in the world, it's a locator service that so you call your son or daughter. How's everything going? You text them. Great, we're over here at Johnny's house. Oh, well, you're at Johnny's house where your phone is over there across town <laughs> on 6th Street in Austin. <laughs> Somebody must have stolen it. <laughs> you got to let them go, but you stay in touch. Cell phones are good to a point, but you got to let them go, mothers. We raised three kids, two of them were boys. They went off to college, they did great. The first semester was wonderful. And about three or four weeks into the semester, at different times, each of my sons called, Dad, we gotta do something about Mom. Why, what's she doing? Well, she's calling and texting all the time. Oh, she just talks on Sunday night. No, she calls, we're praying for you. Hope your test goes well, how's everything going? Love you, praying for you, stay in touch. We love her, and we know she cares for us, but I said, ah, I'm sorry, I didn't know she was sneaking off and doing that. <laughs> so we had that husband-wife talk, and I said, hon, they're men, you got to let them go. But I'm just wanting to know I love them and I pray them. I can assure you they know that. <laughs> now, keep it, to, keep it to Sunday nights, you know, once a week or two. And so she backed off to her credit. I mean, she backed off because I checked on the boy. I said, how's she doing? Uh, she's better. She's doing better. Thank you. Keep it up, you know. I had a mother the other day, she came up, she said her college son, uh, he calls her every two weeks. I said, man, that is awesome. How did he, how'd you get him to do that? She said, I changed the password on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mom, mother, my phone isn't loading up. What did, oh, I changed the password. Well, I got you. How's everything going? Well, it's fine. What's the new password? <laughs> Smart mother now, well, of course, if you're paying for iTunes, it's your privilege to change the password anytime you want. You know, you can call it by your son, first call, second call, third call. <laughs> oh, Hannah, what a mother. Went through her sorrow, she prayed, she promised, she let go, she praised God from whom all blessings flowed, and she stayed in touch with her little boy. Whatever happened to her? Poor thing, she gave up her only son back to the Lord. Look at the rest of the story, verse 20. Before they returned home each time, Eli blesses, blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one she has given to the Lord. And the Lord gave Hannah three sons and two daughters, five more kids. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. The greatest gift you can give your mother is to grow up in the presence of the Lord. Doesn't mean you're a preacher or a prophet. It means you walk in the Spirit. It means you let your mother know uh, wherever I'm at, military or college or other, I'm going to church, I'm reading my Bible, I'm having my quiet time. Mom, I'm walking with the Lord. You let, grow up in the presence of the Lord and you will make your mother the absolute happiest woman that ever walked the earth. She's not trying to control your life. She knows that Jesus, the Lord of creation, is the one who guides you. And if he, she knows you're walking in the Spirit and walking in the presence of the Lord, she can relax and go, Lord, they're all yours. Your mother has prayed for you since before you were conceived. She prayed for you while you were developing your birth, your preschool, your children, your middle school, your teenage, your driving, your college, your career choice, your mate, your dates, and everything else. She has prayed for you, and she continues to pray for you until the last day of her life. Tonight, I want us to pray for the mothers in this house. 
So would all mothers here and all those that are about to be mothers, would you stand up and remain standing? All mothers and soon-to-be mothers, stand up. There they are. <laughs> Woo! Way to go, ladies. Now you keep standing. Now if one of these ladies, if one of these ladies is your mother, would you stand up and just put your arm around her or hug her or put your hand on her shoulder or something like that? And if it's your spouse, you, you can go ahead and do that too. And if you see a mother around and you see she doesn't have a child or a husband near to her, then you just reach out and touch her because that lady brought a life into this world. It is the greatest joy on earth to be a mother. We celebrate it once a year. They pray for us every day of the year. Your mother's awesome. Let's pray together for all the mothers in this room today. Lord Jesus, I praise you for mothers. I praise you for my mother. I praise you for my wife and her motherhood with her children. I praise you for her mother. I praise you for every mother in this room, Lord. Some have gone through their own shares of suffering and heartache and bitterness, and I pray you would restore to them the years that the bitterness took away. I pray for those who are single mothers and trying to do all things to raise up their children. Let them know they're doing an awesome job. May their children rise up and call them blessed, not just when they graduate from high school or college, but throughout the years as those children realize how much their mothers have sacrificed for them, their time, their work, their energy, their emotions, mothers give it all for their children. Lord, this is a weekend where we celebrate mothers and we praise you for them. Thank you for those that are here, those who gave life to children and raised them up and gave them the very best of all they could. And even today, those mothers are still praying for the children, those who walk with the Lord, and even those who don't walk with the Lord, they are still crying out to you. And I pray you would hear their prayers and that each mother here before their time is done will hear each of their children say, Mom, I'm walking in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for the prayers. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.